Well, good morning and welcome to Jefferson Baptist Church today. Let's stand together and praise the Lord. Sing what we believe this morning. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. Precious name of Jesus. 
Amen. I want to welcome you to Jefferson Baptist Church this morning. If you're visiting with us, we extend a special welcome to you, and we ask that you do something for us. In the seat back in front of you, you'll notice a connection card. Take a moment and fill that connection card out, and then you can place it in either one of these offering plates as you exit the sanctuary this morning. Today's a special day in which we will observe the Lord's Supper together as a church family. So I invite you now and throughout as we continue in worship today to prepare your hearts to observe the Lord's Supper together. But at this time, I invite you to turn to your neighbor, greet one another, and we'll continue in just a moment.
Good morning, church. I'm going to ask our deacons who are serving the Lord's Supper to make their way to the front. Um, there's some that are already here. <clears throat> We're going to take the Lord's Supper together. Now, the Lord's Supper is, is one of two ordinances of the church that the Lord has given us, um, baptism being the other. And as we take the Lord's Supper, you know, the Lord's Supper is a holy time for us as Christians and for the church as we remember. And that's what Jesus told us to do. He said to do this in remembrance of me. And what we're remembering is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And really his death, his sacrifice, his blood for our sins. You know, it's a, it's, it's a beautiful imagery. We see this white shroud that covers the elements, the bread and, and, the, and the fruit of the vine. And the bread and the wine represent the uh, the broken body and the blood of Christ. And so this is a funeral shroud that covers the body of Christ. In just a moment, our deacons will, will take this funeral shroud and remove it and fold it, put it to the side, and then we'll partake of the Lord's Supper, His body and His blood, and we'll partake of that together. It's a holy time. It's a time for us to confess our sins. You know, the Bible even warns us not to take the Lord's Supper without our hearts being right. And so we need to be very careful on how we do that. And I'll tell you, for us, you have to be a born-again believer to take the Lord's Supper. You've had to have made a profession of faith and trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or you shouldn't take the Lord's Supper. And so we want to encourage you uh, to keep that in mind as, as we're passing these elements. And so our deacons are going to come, and, uh, and we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper together.
disciples were gathered with Jesus, they were observing the Passover. It was right at the end, just before Jesus was arrested, right before he was about to go through with the sacrifice. The disciples didn't understand everything that was going on, but Jesus was instituting a new practice for the church whenever they were enjoying their supper together. Jesus was going to institute something for us to do to always remember what was about to happen. And at the time, his disciples didn't know. So this was a prophecy. Whenever Jesus broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, do this in remembrance of me, you know, the bread that you have in your hand, you see the holes in it. This is unleavened bread. The lack of leaven shows the absence of sin and Christ was our sinless sacrifice. And that's what this bread represents, the broken body of Jesus Christ. The scripture says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Lord God Almighty, Jesus our Savior, we partake of this bread this morning in your name, remembering that your body was broken for us, that you sacrificed your body because of our sins. And God, we confess our sins to you. I ask that you forgive us. And I pray for every soul in this place, God, as we partake of this bread, God, we remember what you have done for us, Jesus. Amen.
This cup that we hold in our hand represents the blood of Christ shed for the remission of sins, shed for my sins, for your sins. The scripture says, then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Heavenly Father, we come before you acknowledging what you have done for us. Praising Jesus for the sacrifice that he made for us. Thank you for shedding your blood to cover our sins. Dear Lord Jesus, we do this in remembrance of you. Amen. After the supper was over, they, they stayed together, they sang a hymn together, they worshiped together, and then they went out from there and they served together. So let us continue in worship uh, as we continue through our, our Lord's Day.
with you Father how you made a way to heaven for us and we celebrate that today in our worship and in our praise Father speak to us through the preaching of your word this morning move in our hearts change our lives in this place in Jesus name Amen you can be seated Thank you to our choir and orchestra and that, that last song, that was a beautiful song. I think it was a, a new song and uh, I haven't heard that before. And uh, thank you so much, Melanie, and leading out on that, that was beautiful. So thank you for that time of worship, wonderful. We get to take the Lord's Supper together. Now we're going to open God's Word and see what God has to say to us from Nehemiah. We'll be in the fifth chapter. We're in a series of sermons through Nehemiah called A Guide for Spiritual Leadership. And today's message is uh, leading through a crisis. Israel's going to be in a crisis in chapter 5. And Nehemiah, today in this, in this chapter, we're going to see the character of a spiritual leader. You know, leaders, in order to succeed, they must be known as people with character. In all areas of their life, in all their dealings with people, and uh, their use of money, resources, material possessions, nothing will kill the influence of a leader faster than a perceived lack of character. And as we've seen, we're all supposed to be leaders, spiritual leaders. Now remember, Nehemiah, he's not a preacher. He's not a pastor. He's not a priest. He's, he was working as the cupbearer for King Artaxerxes. He was a man of the world. He was an intellectual, worked for the government. But God called him to do something special for him, and he becomes a spiritual leader. And God expects all of us to be spiritual leaders in the church, to grow in our faith, to mature in our faith, to where we're serving the Lord. The leaders have to have character. And nothing will kill that influence and that character in a leader faster than if they're not above board in everything that they're doing, especially with material things, with, with money and things along those li lines, because a perceived lack of character in a spiritual leader, it just takes away their leadership. Nehemiah is God's called man to lead Israel, to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. That's what his vision was, that's what his calling was. He made his way to Jerusalem, and they got to work, and quickly people responded to his leadership, the, the wall was halfway built, and that's where, at that halfway point through that work, that's where the, the, the wheels began to fall off for Nehemiah. They almost fell off completely, as we're going to see today. 
There was a lot of division. Internally, there were threats externally. You know, the people were doing a good work, and they were moving quickly. And then all of a sudden, all these divisions start happening. That's how Satan works. Understand, Satan is real. Demons are real. They work in the church. They work in our lives as Christians. They work against us. They are adversaries of God and of the truth. You know, we don't know everything that they do, but we have enough insight from the Scripture to know how they can influence our lives and how they can insert themselves and cause great divisions in the work of the church. Satan will do all he can to disrupt the work of the Lord's church. Now, Nehemiah and the Jewish people, they were, at first, they were openly attacked. Satan tempted them to give in to fear. They lived, they worked with the constant fear of being attacked by an outside enemy. But when that didn't work, the opposition became more subtle. They were tempted to give in to discouragement. They were halfway through the work, but they were tired. They still saw all that rubble laying around everywhere. They didn't know how they were going to complete it. But when that attack failed, an even more dangerous temptation is going to present itself to these people that were working on the wall. And it's going to come in the form of greed. You know, Satan attacked at a very strategic time. He waited until there was a crisis situation that was going on among the people. And then he tempted the people of means in Jerusalem. The people had money, the people, the, the nobles. He tempted them to take advantage of a financial opportunity at the expense of their brethren. That's what we're going to see in our text today. The very people that Nehemiah was counting on to be his leaders, to fund the project. Instead, they're using their resources for financial, personal gain. Total greed. You know, in chapter 5 of Nehemiah, the, the people of God in the city of Jerusalem, they were in a crisis situation. And Nehemiah, the spiritual leader, is going to have to be the one that's going to have to step up and address this situation. He's going to intervene. And as we're going to see in our passage today, the character of Nehemiah is what's going to enable him to successfully lead Israel through this crisis. So the first five verses of chapter 5, we see the nature of the crisis that, that was facing them at this time. Verse 1 says, And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, We are sons and our daughters are many. Therefore let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and our vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children, as their children. And indeed, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. And it's not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. So here's the nature of the crisis. Verse 1 says that there was a great outcry of the people. And they go to their leader, Nehemiah, airing out their grievances. Some of them had large families and they did not have enough food to eat. Others had property, but they had mortgages on their homes. And because of spiraling inflation, they were in financial bondage. You know, others among them were heavily in debt. They were able, unable to pay back. They had been borrowing money. They were unable to pay it back. And so they were just getting deeper and deeper in the hole. And this probably sounds familiar to a lot of us. You know, this, this is a situation that many people in our culture are facing as well, this kind of financial bondage. You know, however, what we see today in terms of debt is a lot different than what they were dealing with at this time. You know, the debt that oftentimes we are finding ourselves in as a country and our countrymen are is often just self-inflicted. You know, credit cards are so easy to come by and you can, you can buy things that you don't necessarily need. You can put it on credit. And then some life situation happens. A medical event happens or whatever it is and it just goes further and further into debt and you're unable to pay it until it strangles you. There's a lot of people that are going through that. You know, God's word cautions us about excessive borrowing. Believers, whenever we borrow, we're expected to pay back all the money that we owe. You know, the Bible does not condemn borrowing. It does not condemn lending. Psalm 37, 21, however, says this, that the wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous show mercy and give. 
In other words, we as Christians, we're expected to pay our debts. And if we don't have the money to buy the things that we think that we want, then if we don't absolutely need it, then we don't buy it. We go without. That's a challenge. We live in such a materialistic time, and I'm in the midst of it with you. You know, it's a struggle trying to keep up with what we see others doing around us. I can tell you this, our kids aren't going to be ruined because they don't get the latest and the greatest. It's a temptation to think that they will. In fact, they will be ruined, though, if they never have the experience and the blessing of knowing what it means to be without or self, you know, just, just being able to, to wait before they get something, to earn something. You know, we just have a tendency just to give them everything. You know, delayed gratification is a, that leads to virtue in people's lives, and we need to give that to our kids. But the Jewish people in Jerusalem, they were up to their necks in debt. They were in financial bondage. It was a miserable situation. But understand, that wasn't caused by their own greed. The people who were in bondage that were crying out, they were in bondage because of the greed of others taking advantage of them. Why were they in financial bondage? Verse 3, there was a famine. The famine was brought on most likely because of a drought. It was compounded by the fact that there were hundreds of extra people in the city of Jerusalem at this time that were at work building the wall. So the population was bigger. So there was a lot more mouths to feed. In addition to the famine, they were being subjected to very high taxes, verse 4 says. These taxes had to be paid to the royal treasuries of, Ar of, of Artaxerxes. This was Nehemiah's old boss. And they had no choice but to pay those taxes. But further adding to their misery, verse 4 tells us that they were having to borrow money just to pay their taxes. And in verse 5, we see that there was a high interest rate as well. And as a result, they were just spiraling into to more financial bondage. The people were not able to pay their debts. They were then forced to do the unthinkable. They were having to sell their children into slavery to keep off the creditors, to pay their debts. Now, the slavery that, that this is speaking of here is a little bit different than when, whenever we think of slavery, we think of what was going on in early America, but this was different than that. It really wasn't as evil as that, but it was still slavery. But it was almost like a contract. They would, they, they would sell their children for a certain time, and, and they would have to work for those families that, that purchased them. But nevertheless, a slave was owned. They had no rights. According to the law, they could buy back their freedom. But without land, without money, they were without hope. You know, all of these things were bad. But according to verse 1, the outcry of the people, if you, look at, if you think about it, they weren't really crying out to God and to Nehemiah because they were upset about the high taxes. They weren't crying out because of the famine even. Their outcry was against their Jewish brethren. Nehemiah discovered that many of the nobles and Jewish leaders were capitalizing off of the financial crisis. They were lending money. They were charging interest. And this was during a time of crisis, during a drought, when they should have all been pulling together. You know, listen, we have to think of Israel as a church, as a church body, because they were the people of God. They were in a covenant with God. They were brothers and sisters. And they were facing a crisis, yet the rich among them were taking advantage. This is greed at its worst. They are even taking slaves from their fellow believers. Here they are, they're doing a work for the Lord, surrounded by enemies, and yet the wealthy among them are exploiting the situation for their own personal gain. This greed is what causes this incredible leadership crisis for Nehemiah. Now, when you're a leader in the church, there's always going to be some kind of crisis that's caused by the sin of others. This is part of it. As spiritual leaders, there's, there's sinful behaviors among us, and we have to deal with those situations. Nehemiah shows us. Again, we're all supposed to be leaders. Nehemiah shows us how, as leaders, we can deal with the crisis situation. And we're going to look at how Nehemiah responded to this. The first response that we see in Nehemiah whenever this crisis presented itself to him was anger. He was angry. Look at verse 6. Nehemiah says, and I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these works and these words. So Nehemiah's first response is one of anger. He's angry because the work had stopped on the wall. He was angry because those that he was counting on as leaders were actually giving into the temptation. They saw an opportunity to buy land cheap, to pick up slaves basically for free, and they were taking advantage 
of the situation. They were exploiting it. People were desperate at this time. Those with money were moving in. And what made Nehemiah angry is that the Jewish people, it's Jewish people taking advantage of other Jewish people, their fellow Jews. And it was in direct contradiction to the word of God. You know, we tend to think of financial bondage as being, you know, poor people or, or people who, you know, have had a series of unfortunate accidents and it just the debts keep piling on. And that definitely is financial bondage. And sometimes it's no fault of our own. But there's a worse form of financial bondage than that. And oftentimes it's the rich people that get into that financial bondage. And it's greed. Those who are suffering and giving into the temptation for greed, that is a bondage. And it leads to great sin. You know, the love of money over the love of your brothers and sisters. Love over your neighbor. The desire for money driving someone to act unjustly for selfish gain. There's just nothing really lower than that. You know, always in any time of crisis, it's, it's, it's as though we always see folks who are ready to move in and take advantage of the situation. You know, we deal with a lot of crises here in, in Baton Rouge. I mean, there's hurricanes and floods and all these things that have happened over the years and Lord willing won't happen for a long time from now but when those situations take place what do we always hear about the news is always filled with stories of people who have come in from out of state and they're trying to take advantage of the situation they lie to people they say that they can do work that they can't really do we hear about it over and over again and it's absolutely true it happens I remember back during Katrina many many years ago I have read a, a New York Times article that said that there were 2,300 websites seeking donations for Katrina evacuees. 2,300 websites. The vast majority of them, of course, were just fraudulent, just scams, trying to take people's money, which is unbelievable. During Katrina, a million people are displaced, losing everything, and yet there are those who will come in and try to make money off of it. You know, one man that I read about, he was already being taken to court before the storm, but he had registered a lot of web addresses after the storm hit, Katrina.com, KatrinaDonations.com, and he was trying to sell them at $10,000 each, right? Just opportunistic, taking advantage of it. It's shameless. And that expo- that's the greed of the human heart. Times of crisis tends to bring out the worst in people, but praise God, it also tends to bring out the best in people as well because we see other people And I've seen it firsthand, people who go out and they just work and they help and they give. And that's what Christians are supposed to do. And that's exactly what we see Nehemiah doing. Nehemiah is angry. Now let's understand, there's nothing wrong with anger when it's caused by injustice like this. It's called righteous indignation. There's nothing wrong with that kind of anger. In fact, even God can be angry. We live in a culture and a time where people think that if, if we get angry about something, that we're just, we're just judgmental people and we're so harsh and negative when we get angry about things that we see are wrong. I can tell you this. There are certain things that if we're not angry about it, that's sinful. There's some things that we should be angry about. When we see injustice, And I'm not saying what the world calls injustice. They have a perverted sense of what injustice is. But when we see injustice in the church, when we see lies in the church, when we see false teachers in the church, it should make us angry. And we should call it out. When there's false doctrine in the church, that's the work of the devil. That's how he slows up the work. That's how we're supposed to be on the wall building it, but when there's false doctrine... We can't do what we're supposed to do. We should be angry about such things. If we're not angry about it, if we don't get angry whenever we see wrongs in the church, I'm not talking about petty things. I'm talking about significant things like theology and doctrine and dissension, those kinds of things that stop the work. If we don't get angry about that, if we don't have a sense of righteous indignation about it, it just just shows that we don't care. You know, we live in a weird time in this regard, though, in, in our culture. I mean, there's so many, there's churches that their, their entire existence, their entire DNA of their church is built on the idea of never calling out sin, never offending people. 
That that's their approach. That that's what they think that they're supposed to do. They build themselves as the church where you can just come and experience God's love. No matter how you live, no matter what you believe, no matter what you do, no need to repent, no warnings of judgment, no teachings of doctrine, no calling out sin. Just give your money. Everything will be fine. Just come and worship, enjoy the show, and give your money. Listen, we don't get angry if the church doesn't wake up to these things that are going on. There are dark days ahead. And understand, when there's a crisis, spiritual leaders get angry. And it's not the simple kind of anger, but it's the righteous kind of anger, the kind of anger that makes us passionate, the kind of ang- ang- anger that, that moves us, makes us willing to take a stand and to say, this isn't right. To stand on the truth. So Nehemiah, when he saw this, he, he was angry. All right, number two, this is what we see from Nehemiah's leadership during a crisis, is self-reflection. So he was angry, then we see in verse 7, he says, After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers. After serious thought. So Nehemiah, verse 7, he gets alone and he gives the matter serious thought. A better translation would be, I I consulted with myself. That word consult means to give oneself advice, to counsel oneself. When you're mad or you're angry, the best thing you can do as a leader is to get alone, to think it through, to look back in your past experience, to practice some self-reflection, prayer, to consider all the, the angles of the matter. You know, to be a leader, this is, what, this is required. The ability to reflect, to think through all the possible scenarios of whatever situation it is you're facing. You know, Nehemiah, he was a spiritual leader. He was not just a secular leader over a corporation. He was a spiritual leader. So as a spiritual leader, he gets alone. And the, script, the, the passage doesn't say it here, but no doubt, Nehemiah, he prayed. He opened up God's word. He was seeking truth. And the reason we know that is because how he responded to these nobles and these people who were taking advantage of the people. Everything that he condemns the nobles of Israel doing are clearly condemned in the scripture. They were charging interest to their brethren during a time of famine. Exodus 22, 25, God instructs his people, if you lend money to my people, this is what God says, if you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, You are not to act as a creditor to him. You shall not charge him interest. So they were were charging interest on people who were taking out loans just to purchase the essentials of life. To have money for taxes, have money for food. Listen, you don't loan people money. Your brothers and sisters in Christ loan them money so they can go buy food because they're starving. You give them. They're supposed to be giving. Deuteronomy 23, 19, God said, you shall not charge interest to your countrymen, interest on money, food, or anything that may be loaned at interest. In verse 20, God tells us why. So that your Lord, your God, may bless you in all that you undertake. Now these nobles, they were enslaving their fellow Jews. God said in Leviticus 25, you shall not subject your countrymen to a slave service. He shall be with you as a hired man, as if he were a sojourner with you. Now no doubt Nehemiah knew these verses. He knew the word of God in his time of reflection as he was trying to to gather his thoughts on how he was going to deal with this situation. He was very angry. He consulted God's word. He prayed. Now notice he did this though before he went and confronted the nobles. I think this is the point that we need to, to take in hand. You know, this was wise leadership. You know, leaders should never respond in raw emotion. You know, that's always the temptation. You know, somebody hurts us or somebody says something or we see something we, that we know is wrong and just in our emotion and our anger, we respond and we start speaking when we really shouldn't. That's a big mistake that some, some leaders make. And we're, again, we're all to be leaders. When there's something that you're leading and something that you are, care very deeply about and something's not going the way you want it to go, it's better to pause and take time for some self-reflection, to consider all the different issues to really pray about how you're going to respond. This is exactly what Nehemiah did. This is how he dealt with this crisis. So Nehemiah is facing this crisis. He was angry. He gave the matter serious thought and prayer. And then number three, once we've done those things, that's when we speak truth. 
All right, verse 7 again. Nehemiah says, After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, Each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them, and I said to them, According to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold into the nations. Now, indeed, will you even sell your brethren? Or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. Then I said, what you're doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? I also, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and grain. Please let us stop this usury. Restore now to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, their houses, also a hundredth of the money and the grain, the new wine and the oil that you have charged them. So they said, verse 12, we will restore it and we will require nothing from them. We'll do, we will do as you say. Then I called the priests and required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. So after Nehemiah gave this matter serious thought, he knew what he needed to do. He went and he rebuked these nobles and these rulers that were taking advantage of their brethren. He spoke the truth. Now understand, Nehemiah needed these guys. He needed them on his side. They were people of means. Here he is trying to fund this massive project. He needed all the leaders of the people to be on board. He could have been tempted, you know, to, to look the other way or to kind of brush it to the side or put his arm around and say, hey, you know, maybe we should think of a different way of doing this. Now, Nehemiah spoke the truth, cost him whatever it may. He didn't look the other way. In fact, he said in verse 7, he said, I cannot believe what you guys are doing. You're, you're charging interest to your brethren in the, midst, in the midst of a famine. So he called an assembly against them. That means he gathered, gathered we, what we'd call that in the Baptist church, he scheduled an unplanned business meeting. That's always a bad thing. An unscheduled, if you ever hear me say, there's an unscheduled business meeting. That's, I mean, sometimes that's bad, not all the time. Sometimes it could be good, but we like the planned ones much better. Got the whole church together. And he called them to obey God's word, to restore to their brethren their freedom, to restore the money that they took from them. Verse 8, he shamed them by pointing out that he, along with the other nobles, whenever Nehemiah came into town, they used their own money to go and purchase many of these Jews out of slavery from the nations around them. He says, now here you are putting them back into slavery after I've already purchased their freedom. Verse 9, he scolded them. He says, will you not walk in the fear of God? Are you so hard-hearted that you don't care that your behavior is bringing shame on the name of God? Here you are, God's people, acting just like the pagans in the world. Christian, we are God's people. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a child of God. You carry the name of Jesus Christ on you. If people know that you are a Christian, that means you have a responsibility to represent the name of Jesus Christ to the world so that they might come to know Christ, so that they might be saved. How dare we live like the world and act like the world? Is it possible that some of us, when our brothers and sisters in Christ are out there working on the wall, sacrificing, living for the Lord, sacrificing the world so they can be more faithful to Christ, being faithful in the church, being faithful in everything, and yet we go among them and cause dissension or hurt them or take advantage of them? Do we not fear God? We represent Christ to the world. If we live like the world and act like the world, think about that. While our brothers and sisters in Christ are sacrificing the things of the world and we're going out and living like the world, not living differently, it damages the witness of the church. It makes the world call us hypocrites. Nehemiah says, he says, what you're doing is not good. He was very bold. And sometimes we have to speak the truth to each other. We have to go to our brother and sister in Christ and say, you know what, what you're doing, it's, it's not good. What's amazing is they agreed. They repented. And they agreed to restore the freedom of their brothers and sisters and their money. You know, in our experience, it seems so unrealistic when somebody is in a hole that deep where they're actually so hard-hearted that they're willing to try to capitalize on other people's suffering 
We wouldn't expect them to repent of it. Sometimes it happens. It's a miracle. That's the Spirit of God moving. They responded to Nehemiah's leadership in this way. And they admitted that what they did was wrong. But, you know, it, it's, it's hard to admit wrongdoing. I understand that. We're all humans. It's hard to admit when we're wrong. But, man, there's nothing more God-glorifying than when a believer can just humble themselves. So, you know what? I was wrong. What I said was wrong. What I did was wrong. I ask for your forgiveness. That glorifies the Lord. Verse 12, we see that these nobles responded to the leadership of Nehemiah. They say, we will restore it. We will do as you say. So again, here we see how spiritual leaders lead during a crisis. Nehemiah was angry. He engaged in self-reflection. Then he spoke the truth. And there's one final point. He was accountable. He was accountable. Verse 14. This is how Nehemiah made himself accountable. He says, moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore, bore rule over the people. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. Indeed, I also continued to work on this wall, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work, and at my table were 150 Jews and rulers, besides those who came to us from the nations around us. Now that which was prepared daily was one ox, six choice sheep, fowl was prepared for me, and once every 10 days, an abundance of all kinds of wine. Yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provisions because of the bondage was heavy on this people. Remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. So in this passage, Nehemiah gives a full account of his financial dealings. He just laid it all out for everybody to see. Nobody had to question if Nehemiah was skimming from the top or taking advantage of others. Everything was above board. Everything was open. And that's how it should be in the church among Christians. There are so many pastors and churches that have fallen because of a lack of financial accountability. I can tell you churches in Louisiana right now, Baptist churches, where because there's a lack of accountability, the churches are falling apart. And over the years, I've seen many spiritual leaders take advantage of the resources of the church. And we've all seen churches where the spiritual leaders are enriched. I can tell you this, it brings shame on the name of Christ. We see these television preachers who enrich themselves off of God's people. They purchase jets. They purchase multi-million dollar homes. Some cases, multiple homes, mansions. And they just keep doing it. They just keep getting away with it. Gullible people, I guess, just send them their money. It's unbelievable. There's so many stories of churches that were ruined because of a lack of accountability. And every one of them brings shame on the church. You know, if every church, or if a church, or a minister, or a spiritual leader, or some group that you're giving money to, if they're unwilling to show their books, if they're unwilling to be fully accountable, if there's a church that's unwilling to be fully accountable financially, you don't have to wonder if there's something going on behind the scenes that's wrong. I can promise you there is. They're hiding things. So in these verses, we see a general account of Nehemiah's leadership. Nehemiah lived in moderation. You know, he had, a, he had a right to more money as the governor, but he was taking less than what the governors before him made. You know, Paul wrote to Timothy in chapter 3 when he gave the qualifications of spiritual leaders. And those leaders, they, they were not to be greedy for money. We need to practice moderation. You know, Nehemiah lived below his means. That's the character of a spiritual leader. So Nehemiah offers full disclosure of his financial dealings. He was transparent. And in the ministry and the life of a spiritual leader, this what, must be what happens. The money that comes into the house of God is money given specifically by the people of God. That's the same in Nehemiah's day. It's the same in our day as well. And for a spiritual leader to hide their financial dealings, that's a sacrifice of character. And it's just not going to work. You know, they might still be able to take advantage of those who are just gullible or those who are just blindly follow them, 
following them, but that's the extent of their influence. Now imagine the Apostle Paul. You know, remember he was going around making a collection for the, the church in Jerusalem? He was going through all those Greek cities, all those Greek churches, and he said, lay aside a certain portion on, on Sundays, and I'm going to come by, I'll pick it up, and we're going to take it to Jerusalem, because Tr- Jerusalem was suffering tremendously, the church was. Imagine if the Apostle Paul would have collected all of that money and never was accountable for it. Never let anybody know what happened to the money. And then he moves into the fanciest neighborhood in Corinth and buys the biggest house. You know, what would have happened? There wouldn't be an Apostle Paul. We wouldn't be talking about him. And yet we see that happening over and over again in the church. You know, Paul, like Jesus, like Nehemiah, he was transparent. And the result was his character. Inspired truth, inspired faith. So in this day of crisis, Nehemiah paid, his leadership paid off because the people responded to him. And Nehemiah prayed in verse 19, he said, Remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. You know, that should be our motivation for serving the Lord. God, remember me. You know, I don't need the praise of man. You know, as spiritual leaders, you know, there's many of you, you lead in ministries of this church. You, you serve the Lord in, a, in countless ways. There's so many of you. And you don't get credit for it. You don't get glory for it. You don't need it. Just say, God, pray like Nehemiah. God, remember me for good for all that I do for this people. You know, Nehemiah didn't need the praise of man. He didn't need the thanks of man. He needed to know that his God saw him. Listen, that's enough. That's who we serve. We're all to be busy leaders serving on the wall, doing our work for the Lord, for then his name and for his glory's sake. And I pray that you'll be a leader. Join me in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we, uh, we pause right now and we come before you. God, raise up leaders among us, those who will serve, those who will re- follow you with, with character like Nehemiah. God, we give you this time of invitation. We dedicate it to you. Holy Spirit, move in our lives and in our hearts. And for those that need to make a decision to follow you today, God, I pray that they'll be bold. They'll step out and make that commitment today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll stand with me at this time. This is our invitation time. This is the way we do it at Jefferson. If you're ready to, if you're, if you're ready to be a part of our church family, we'd love to welcome you to our church family today. And the way you do that at our church, you have to be a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. You have to be saved. And then you just step out from where you are. We ask that you make that commitment public. Just walk down here to the front when Colin starts to sing in just a moment. I'll be standing right here in the front. We'd love to welcome you to our church family. Some of you need to be baptized. Some of you need to commit your life to Jesus Christ and to surrender to him. If you know God's calling you to be saved and you know you need to be saved, maybe you're here today and you don't know for certain that if you were to die right now, you can't say for certain, yes, I know I would go to heaven. Listen, God doesn't want you to live that way. He wants you to have that certainty. He wants you to know that you are his child. And we'd love to be able to talk with you and pray with you about that. And if, you, if you'd like to talk about that, we, what we ask is just make that public. Just step out where you are. We're not going to ask you to talk or make a speech. We'll pray with you. We'll counsel with you. So we invite you to come as Colin leads us.
thank you, Colin. A couple of announcements I'll introduce this one that has come today. Um, don't forget about our Wednesday night activities. We got children's ministry. We have youth ministry. We have a meal at 5 o'clock. Um, then all those ministries begin at 6 o'clock. And we have a Bible study here in the sanctuary, Dr. Jamie Dew. Uh, we got him for about three or four more weeks. Don't miss out on him. He's teaching a class on apologetics, which is very unique to have a seminary president here teaching. And uh, so you need to come and catch that and be a part of that. That's at 6 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Um, we also have, of course, our college ministry meets. Everybody's meeting on Wednesday night, so we encourage you to be here. Come get a meal at 5 o'clock. The Village is celebrating Galentine's Day with a focus on self-care on February the 10th at 6 o'clock in the college room. The Village is our women's ministry. We would like to see every woman in the church. Maybe you're visiting today. We'd love to have you come and be a part of this. That's February the 10th at 6 o'clock. Child care is available for children under four. You need to RSVP for child care. Uh, the Valentine's Day Variety Show will be on February the 11th, which is when? Friday night, this Friday night at 6 o'clock. The theme is a Southern Serenade. The song list includes Southern Gospel hymns, bluegrass. So it's kind of a country theme. Um, but you need to reserve your spot today. You can sign up today out here in the middle foyer. This, there's a cost to this. Tickets are $20. You get a full meal for that, plus just... This is going to be a wonderful night. The max is $100 per family. Um, it's a fun night every year that we do this. It's a fundraiser for missions for 2022. So we encourage you to sign up for that today. And also put on your calendar the Cajun cook-off. This is going to be on February the 20th. And listen, if you have a Cajun dish that you're really good at cooking, you need to enter it and cook a bunch of it and, uh, and bring it on February 20th. I think we have, how many cooks do we have signed up right now? We have 24, so look, we'd love to get that up to 30 or 35. So look, enter, you know, whatever it is that you cook. There's gonna, it's gonna, and it's a competition too. Um, so we're gonna see who makes the best, and I'm, I'll, I'll decide what that is. Um, no, I'm not gonna. I would never do. I'm not putting myself in that situation at all. Um, it'll be a closed ballot or something. I don't know. Um, but I'm looking forward to eating some of that Cajun food. I'll tell you that. Um, C colon if, uh, if you want to sign up and uh, be one of the cooks. Any other announcements? All right. All right. I'm going to ask uh, Bonnie to come stand up here with me. Uh, Bonnie, how do you say your last name? Eskine. Eskine. Bonnie Eskine. And uh, Bonnie's been coming for the, to the church for, for a while. And, uh, and, uh, but she, just this past week, she uh, prayed to receive Christ and settled out in her life. She is born again. And uh, we are so excited for you and thankful for you. And that's settled in your life, right? Absolutely it is. I got to talk with Bonnie and, and uh, we've, we've talked it through, prayed together. And I'm so excited about her commitment to follow Christ. I'm going to get to baptize her very soon. And uh, we just welcome you into our church family. God bless you, Bonnie. So uh, I'm going to close this in prayer right now. Y'all come down. Y'all welcome Bonnie and, and uh, let her know how thankful you are for her. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Uh, God, we just rejoice over Bonnie's commitment today, making a public stand for Christ. And God, I pray that you bless her. I pray that this will be a place where she can grow in her faith and serve you. And uh, God, we just thank you so much for sending her to us. God, as we leave this place today, and we go back out into the world, back out into the place where you've called us to live and to work and to go to school. God, I pray that Jefferson Baptist Church, as we go out there, that we'll go as lights for Christ, bold in our faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.